So the circle, which is our image for this morning, often, often represents the perfect community. It um, it's represents completeness and wholeness. And so often when I officiate at weddings, I bring up this image of the circle as a way of talking about the rings and what they mean as far as commitment and how they fit into this symbol of completeness. I, I talk about um, symbols and circles that we see in nature, for instance. I talk about the nests that birds make, the, uh, the image that we have of the, the sun and the moon, of the cycle of the seasons that make a perfect circle from you know, beginning of the year to the end of the year and round about again. We, uh, we heard a song this morning about circles. One of our favorite hymns is Break Not the Circle, which we'll sing as our closing hymn today. But I want to begin by saying that Break Not the Circle, the words I have sometimes, um, I've sometimes wondered about break not the circle. It tells us to break not the circle, but then it asks us to make it wider still. So how do we do that without breaking it open? I've often wondered when I heard those words. So I've been toying with this idea of the circle as a symbol for community. And um, I've thought about the ways in which it a circle can create insiders and outsiders and discrete boundaries and lines. And I'm wondering if that's actually a, a healthy image for our communities. I found a poem recently on the Soul Matters website. And uh, even though it doesn't have an author, I love the poem because it brings into question this idea of seeing our communities as circles. And so I want to read this poem to you. It begins with this question. Is it possible that being on the inside leaves you out of the loop? What if the margins aren't narrow? What if that space of, of exclusion is also a position of perspective? What if being shut out allows you to understand the insiders better than they can understand themselves? And why do so many seek the safety of that inner circle anyway? Don't we know that the circles not only keep others out, but also the air. Haven't we learned that it is on the edge of circles that hate makes its, its home? So even if you weren't among the ones who put the circle in place, by allowing it to linger, don't you carry the burden of responsibility? as well? What if we who, what if who we are doesn't end at the barriers of our own skin? What if sin is believing that you can put the puzzles together only with the pieces that belong to you? What if heaven is the moment you realize that none of us can get there alone? What if the only true freedom lies in the willingness to fight against what imprisons someone else? And if that is true, then let's widen the circle until it breaks. For as long as a circle exists and parts of ourselves will always be on the other side of the line, let us push, 
pull, twist, and tear. Dig underneath and climb over the top. Do whatever it takes to meet each other face to face. And having found each other, let us stare and struggle and fight and forgive, calling in, calling out, until me and you dissolves into us. Is there any other way to become whole? The author asks us. You know, I'm, I've been thinking this week about how uh, the last two years have been really difficult for our congregations with the pandemic. We have all struggled to try to be community in diaspora. We've struggled with decisions about when to open, when to be online, when to do both, um, how to be together, what, you know, what kinds of spaces need to be between us, whether to mask or unmask, whether the speakers are gonna be masked or unmasked. And all of these decisions have been exhausting, especially for the leaders of the congregations who have to make these decisions. And all of us miss being with the people that we love and care about. We yearn for that sense of being in community in person again. And I, I especially want to do, um, I especially want to make a shout out to those um, extroverts among us that, that get energy from being around other people. I know it's really, really been hard for all of you. So with this strong yearning that we all have to be back in community together again, I do have a worry that when we finally, and keep, we're keeping our fingers crossed here, when we finally this spring begin meeting in person again, are, is that yearning to be with people that we very much care about going to affect the way we see strangers in our midst? What is the circle going to look like when we meet again in person, when our doors are finally open? So I thought it might be a good, um, a good idea to reflect on what it means to be a circle of ever-widening love as spring draws closer and we um, begin to think about what it means to live a more normal community life. Let me ask all of you listening this morning, have you ever been saved by someone who widened the circle so that you could be included? And what kind of shape shifting needed to happen in order for that circle to include you? Think about this scenario. Um, you are, um, we're meeting again as congregations and you in, have been invited to a circle at your congregation to explore and discuss something that has a, a lot of meaning for you. And as you get there, you, um, you walk through the doors, you look at the circle and you're on time, by the way. But as you look at the circle, you realize that this perfect circle in the room that has been formed for you has very few empty chairs and uh, the chairs that are kind of empty have um, book bags or purses or coats or whatever on them. So even though there's not a person sitting there, you know that that chair is not really for you to sit in, right? And more people begin to arrive for this conversation. Um, they're also seeing there, that there aren't any chairs available in this perfect circle that has been formed. And so what happens? 
some people may get up and start um, looking for more chairs to add to the circle. Some people are going to scooch their chairs over so there's more room. And as all this shape shifting begins to happen, uh, you're not really a circle anymore, right? You're maybe an oblong or a snake-like um, configuration. Maybe you have to put some chairs behind the circle that you originally made. But that perfect circle that was there is no longer available. How do we react to this kind of shape shifting? of drawing the circle wider. Do we sigh in frustration because we're no longer this perfect circle? Do we um, get frustrated about the fact that maybe we've got people sitting behind us now because there wasn't room for just one circle? Are we a little bit um, out of sorts because we had this nice comfy chair, but when we got up to bring out the folding chairs. Somebody sat in our seat and now we're going to have to sit in a chair that's less comfortable than what we wanted. Are people getting grumpy about this new configuration? Or do they do it gladly? How much shape shifting are we willing to do in order to welcome people into our circle of wholeness? Years ago, I was, uh, I was a guest preacher at a Unitarian, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. And as I was at the pulpit, I noticed in the crowd, in one of the pews, this gentleman who was kind of unkempt, had a, a suit, a black suit on with a tie and a white shirt uh, that wasn't quite old enough to be vintage yet, but it was, you know, it was getting close. And in his lap, he carried what looked like a leather bound Bible. He didn't stay for coffee. He disappeared right after the service was over. But as I was talking to other members of the congregation um, while during coffee hour, while we were, um, we were gathered there, several people mentioned him to me and asked me if I would, had noticed him. And I said, yeah, I did, I did notice. And one woman said, you know, this is his third time here now. And I'm beginning to wonder if somebody should talk to him and maybe tell him that he doesn't really belong here. And so I ask again, how much shape shifting are we willing to do in order to make our circles wider? And what are the boundaries that we create as we consider this metaphor of the circle for our communities. I've been thinking about uh, the Zen exercise of creating what's called an enzo. Um, what happens is during a meditation, you take up a brush with ink on it. And on the out breath, you draw a circle with the brush. And you need to do this in one single stroke on, on one single breath. And you'll notice that as you do this, each and so is going to look different. Each one is going to be imperfect. You'll be able to see the actual hairs of the brush on the paper. And you'll notice that it, 
it begins um, being very thick and then tapers off as you get close to the end so that the circle that you're drawing freehand never actually closes. The beauty of this and so lies in the fact that it is always imperfect. It is always slightly open. And so it invites us in. It's very welcoming and warm as we consider the invitation that that uh, meditator is giving us as their hand is arcing through the air in that single breath. It's very human and so it's very imperfect. I wonder what it would feel like to have this, the and so, as our model for our faith communities instead of the perfect circle. A perfect circle has insiders and outsiders. There is an expectation of sameness and perfection with a circle. What if there was an, an expectation instead that every time we gather, every time we redraw the circle, it looks slightly different that we are in fact each time we gather creating a whole new community who needs you to widen the circle for them and what might your community need to let go of if you were going to draw this handmade circle in order to include them I want to return for a moment to that man with the Bible in his lap and ask the question, if he showed up someday at Peace Fellowship, would he belong? Why or why not? How would you make that decision? I've often felt that our stumbling around as Unitarian Universalists, when we're talking about widening our cir circles so that newcomers feel truly at home um, without stepping on any of the landmines that we tend to bury in our, in our sanctuaries, has to do with um, so-called tolerance. Tolerance, especially when we combine it with the idea of freedom, is sometimes just a reluctance for us to draw clear boundaries around who we are and who we are not. Who we are willing to welcome and who we are not willing to welcome into our communities. I find that the most welcoming congregations are those that make clear distinctions between legitimate boundaries and illegitimate boundaries. Let me give you an example. Our principles, for instance, say that we support the democratic process, right? And so for me, the anti-democratic rhetoric of fascism or authoritarianism is not or should not be welcome in our communities. That is a legitimate boundary. And hate-filled speech and bullying is an anathema of our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of each person. And so, we have reasons to address bullying and hate-filled speech in our congregations. Any behavior really that is, um, that tends to destroy our relationships with each other should not be welcomed. It is enabling, it is 
um, even a kind of collaboration when we accept it in our congregations. And so we do find that sometimes we have to be prepared to tell people that unless they uh, leave those kinds of behaviors at home, they can't be welcomed in our communities. When we can be clear about what our legitimate boundaries need to be, then we can begin to look at and recognize some of the illegitimate boundaries we create in our circles. Um, illegitimate reasons for keeping people out. When we become clear about who we are and what we're about, we don't have to be anxious about smaller changes like moving the chairs around, scooching the chairs around that give us a configuration that doesn't look quite so perfect to us. We don't need to have you know, those fake fights about the hymns that we sing or uh, the clothes that we wear or what divinity we pray to or don't even pray to at all. All of these things can become less important when we are able to create a solid foundation of what we're about and where we take our stand. We don't have to bury landmines, my friends. Instead, we can see ourselves as circles that are open, fluid, human, and therefore very imperfect. Those who are still on the outside not only need our saving faith, but they have much to teach us and they have much to offer us. So let's widen that circle until it breaks wide open. And let's not be afraid to do that. Even as we sing our closing hymn, which is Break Not the Circle, I encourage us to think about doing just that. May it be so, and blessed be.